Hey, 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 happy Friday. Yes, come in, pull up a chair. The Daily Dope is in the air. All right, so that was weird. So I redid my opening, right, for the show, and uh, it was not the right size. <laughs> that was pretty bizarre. Should have taken a look at that when I switched over to the new video. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, that's okay. <laughs> Still a big deal. But how's everybody doing? I am Jeff McAleer. I am your host here at The Daily Dope, presented by TheGamingGang.com. Tonight is Friday, June 21st. This is episode 319 of The Daily Dope. So today also happens to be the first day of summer. Nice. Ha <laughs> ha. Finally. Although it has not been summer like here in the Chicago area. It's been crummy. It's supposed to warm up this weekend. So fingers crossed on that. Today also has, happens to be the uh, summer solstice. So it will be the longest day of the year. And then it's all downhill from here, I guess. Kind of weird that the first day of summer is actually the longest day. I don't know. Just seems kind of strange. You would think kind of like midsummer. A midsummer's night, right? Uh, you would think midsummer would be the longest day. But now it happens to be today, the first day of summer. All right. So this is a live show. If this is the first time you've popped in to visit with me, welcome aboard. This is a very casual show. Normally, I'll just uh, share some tabletop gaming news, sometimes some geek culture news as well, and uh, do un game unboxings, game reviews. We take a look at role-playing games, a bunch of different stuff. So very, very casual. Because this is a live show, chat is available on YouTube. It's not on screen. It's one of the ways that I keep some of the stranger commenters at bay. But I do pay attention to chat. So if you'd like to say hello... By all means, please do. If you got a question, fire away. Or if there's something about Sorcerer, which is from White Wizard Games that we're going to crack open and take a first look at today. If you want to see something a little closer up, or maybe you've got a question about uh, what we're taking a peek at, by all means, chime in. I will respond. If you like the video, please give it a quick thumbs up. If you check out some of the videos on the Gaming Gang channel, and you like them, by all means, please subscribe. Of course, if you do subscribe, please ring that bell because not only will that tell you when a new video is posted, because there are videos that go up that are not episodes of The Daily Dope. Uh, for an example, all the uh, Origins Game Fair interviews I just finished up. Anyway, if you ring that bell, you'll be notified not only when a new video goes up, but you'll also find out when the stream goes live within about five minutes or so. And of course, by all means, please tell a friend. Okay, so let's jump into the tabletop gaming news for tonight. I've got uh, a little bit of news. Uh, one news piece is fairly long, but um, there's a reason that I'm sharing it because there's a couple of things that I noticed about it that I wanna talk a little bit about after uh, that news piece. But do want to point out, I know there are some folks out there who do not care for the tabletop gaming news. So by all means, if you're not watching live, take a look in the show notes below. There are timestamps. You can skip ahead to the unboxing of Sorcerer. Anyway, jumping into the news, arriving from Yellow Games at Gen Con is Ishtar Gardens of Babylon. Of course, based on the hit cult film starring Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty. Nah, I don't think so. Anyway, I have the dope on Ishtar. From the award-winning designer Bruno Cathala, Ishtar is a game in which you play the role of a gardener aiming to transform the dry desert into the lost hanging gardens of Babylon. To accomplish your mission, you will have to plant flowers, which, if you place them well, can help you gather precious gems and activate actions. Whether to buy trees, which will block the link between two flower spots as well as earning you points, or to purchase upgrades, 
such as getting two more points per tree card at the end of the game. Collecting gems will be a crucial part of the game as well. Get them before your opponents, recruit apprentices, send them to earn points in the copses of flowers you've created, block others, and think carefully of the upgrades to purchase if you want to become the best gardener at the end of the game. Ishtar Gardens of Babylon is for two to four players, ages 14 and up, plays around 45 minutes. There is no official street date yet, although usually with yellow games, when they do a convention release, it's within about two weeks. Those games actually hit uh, your friendly local game stores. Uh, I do not have MSRP information available just yet as well. I do want to point out the uh, images that I'm sharing right now don't really show the layout of the game. I did get a chance to take a quick peek at this setup at Origins. There is an image on Board Game Geek that uh, Eric Martin took that, of course, obviously, I'm not going to steal that and share it. But uh, it's not a big footprint game. This is not a big footprint game and you kind of lay tiles out for the desert. Uh, there's a lot of little like gems, things like that. In fact, <laughs> When I was uh, doing my interview with Yellow Games, I bumped <laughs> bumped the layout with my mic and sent a bunch of stuff kind of, not flying, but off their specific spots and things like that. Anyway, this could be kind of interesting. Uh, and of course, it's a family game. All right, so there's my family game <laughs> news for the night. Because Catalyst Game Lamps is going to be releasing Shadowrun Sprawl Ops coming this July, and I've got the dope. Shadowrun Sprawl Ops is a competitive game for two to four players that can be played in 60 to 90 minutes. In this cyberpunk worker placement game, ah, wait a second here, why are we getting these images coming up? What in the world? Huh, that's weird. I had five images and the fifth image is not showing up correctly. Strange. Okay. Anyway, in this cyberpunk worker placement, look at this. What is what is the image that's coming up like this? Hold on a moment here. Let's take a look. So that's that's I think the one that's not coming up right. Because I have an image that's actually going to show kind of the layout here, and I wanted to share that. So anyway. For some reason, when I transferred over the uh, the slides, one of them must not have copied over. My apologies on that, because I'm not talking about a blue-orange game. Anyway, in this cyberpunk worker placement game, each player controls a team of shadow runners that they can send on missions, loan to other players for a fee, of course, and upgrade with new tech and equipment. Missions are resolved by rolling combinations of custom dice. A diverse team of shadow runners gives you access to more combinations of dice and your upgrades add even more dice to your pool. Take on smaller missions to earn creds, then put those right back into more experienced runners and better gear. Once you think you've got what it takes, send your runners out to attempt to collect one final score. If you fail, don't worry, your dock wagon contracts will keep your runners in the game. The first player to successfully complete the final mission and collect that last big score wins the game. Shadowrun Sprawl Ops is for two to four players, ages 13 and up, plays in around an hour to 90 minutes, and will carry an MSRP of $49.99 when it arrives on July 10th. So I had spoke to Jason Hardy from Catalyst Game Labs at Origins, and he was talking about that they really feel this board game captures Shadowrun, the role-playing game, in a tabletop board game. So I'm kind of curious. I want to say I believe that uh, Lynn Vander Game Studio or Lynn Vander Studios uh, also helped on this design. I think they worked on this design as well. Something else I'm going to point out, and I am going to... No, uh... oh, where did I put it? Yep. Oh. I brought it uh, brought it upstairs. Okay, anyway. Well, I won't switch cameras then. Uh, I took a first look at the Shadowrun 6th World Beginner Box on last night's show. And uh, my understanding was it was kind of trickling out to retail stores. That it was supposed to be like an official 
Release date was June 15th. That is not the case. I did check with a distributor and they're saying that the official launch date for the beginner box is actually July 10th, just like Sprawl Ops. So, something to keep in mind. So I will actually have my review of the beginner box out there before it goes on sale. So be able to cut to the chase. Anyway, as I mentioned, I've got kind of a longer news story and uh, it is Paizo Inc. And their September titles that they're releasing for Starfinder and Pathfinder. I've got the dope. Because first off, we've got the Starfinder Adventure Path, The Last Refuge. Fleeing a world consumed by the ravenous alien swarm, the heroes and a handful of desperate survivors limp toward the nearest colony world in a newly acquired starship. After thwarting a mutiny, they reach a large metropolis where tensions are high. Local fanatics claim the oncoming swarm is a punishment for the system's sins, disrupting the military's efforts to take in refugees. Worse, a series of caravans below the city that provide the only refuge from inevitable invasion are far from unoccupied, and they must be cleared out before time runs out. The Last Refuge is a Starfinder role-playing game adventure for four third-level characters. The adventure continues the Attack of the Swarm Adventure Path, a six-part monthly campaign in which the heroes fight back against a ruthless and nigh-unstoppable alien invasion. This adventure also includes an early history of the Swarm Spawn Sheeran race, an exploration of biomechanical starships, and a selection of new Swarm monsters and other harrowing threats. This will carry an MSRP of $22.99. Kabuki Kid is popping into chat. Good to see you, Double K. Welcome aboard. Might be a quiet night in chat tonight. It is Friday, and it is the first night of summer. Anyway, back to the news. There is also the Starfinder flip mat, Starliner. Whether the heroes are investigating a mysterious murder among the passengers of an interstellar cruise ship or journeying between distant ports of call on a galaxy-spanning voyage, no game master wants to spend time drawing every stateroom and lounge. Fortunately, with Paizo's latest Starfinder flip mat, you don't have to. This line of gaining, bah, gaming maps provides ready-to-use science fantasy set pieces for the busy game master. This double-sided map features two decks of a luxurious Starliner. Don't waste time sketching when you could be playing. With Starfinder Flip Mat Starliner, you'll be ready the next time your players take a cruise. And of course, a special coating on each flip mat allows you to use wet erase, dry erase, and permanent markers with ease. Removing permanent ink is easy. Simply trace over any permanent mark with a dry erase marker. Wait 10 seconds, then wipe off both marks with a dry cloth or paper towel. Hmm, I did not, uh, did not realize that's how you get rid of permanent marker on these. Anyway, the flip mat will carry an MSRP of $14.99. Then there's also Pathfinder Pawns, Tyrant's Grasp Pawn Collection, Monsters, friends, and foes from the Tyrant's Grasp Adventure Path come alive on your tabletop with the Tyrant's Grasp Pawn Collection, featuring more than 100 pawns for use with the Pathfinder role-playing game or any tabletop fantasy RPG. Printed on sturdy cardstock, each pawn presents a beautiful full-color image of a monster or NPC from the Tyrant's Grasp campaign, including gruesome undead, vile cultists, otherworldly soul shepherds, and lots of other allies and enemies. The Tyrant's Grass Pawn Collection, together with the creatures and characters from the Pathfinder Pawn's Bestiary Box and NPC Codex Box Collections, <sighs> provides pawns for nearly every Tyrant's Grasp encounter. Each cardstock pawn slots into a size-appropriate plastic base from any of the Bestiary Box Collections, making the pawns easy to mix with traditional metal or plastic miniatures. With tons of distinct images, the Tyrant's Grass Pawn Collection brings to life, or unlife, the enemies and allies from all six adventures of, yes, you guessed it, the Tyrant's Grasp Adventure Path. This will carry an MSRP of $24.99. Then we have the Pathfinder RPG Villain Codex Pocket Edition. Villains are at the heart of every great adventure, scheming, plotting, and causing mayhem. But creating a convincing and detailed group of antagonists 
is no easy task. Pathfinder RPG Villain Codex serves up 20 groups of vile miscreants waiting to menace your player characters and foil their every plan. Inside this time-saving tome, you'll find a wide variety of foes, from a scheming regal court to a sinister doomsday cult, ready to challenge characters of any level. These villains come equipped with a host of new rules, elements to give them the edge against players and fit into nearly any campaign. This will carry an MSRP of $19.99. Monsters have long stalked us in the darkness with the bestiary number six. Within this book, you'll find a host of these creatures for use in the Pathfinder role-playing game. Face off against archdevils and the horsemen of the apocalypse, planar dragons, and the legendary wild hunt, proteans and psychopomps, and hundreds more. Some creatures, such as the capricious Tanawa, the mysterious green man, or the powerful imperial lords, might even be willing to provide your heroes aid if they deserve it. Of course, the Bestiary Volume 6 Pocket Edition will also carry an MSRP of $19.99. These September releases will arrive on the 18th. Hey, and I see Jorge Rodriguez has popped in. Good to see you, Jorge. So, uh, the reason why I wanted to share that kind of long news piece about all the Paizo releases in September is two things caught my eye. Number one, there is no Pathfinder Adventure Path. So I thought that was kind of strange because, of course, in August, we get second edition Pathfinder. Now, there are supposed to be I do believe 10 releases all hitting for the second edition of Pathfinder that'll all come out at Gen Con, unless they've changed things since last I heard. But I still thought it's a little strange that the month after, there's no adventure path for second edition Pathfinder. Because, you know, I mean, it's a monthly thing, right? So here was the other thing that I was kind of curious about. We have all these, like the Best Yeri Volume 6, We've got the NPC Codex Pocket Edition. I'm kind of curious. I don't think those are for second edition. So I'm wondering how much support Paizo is going to continue to give first edition Pathfinder right after second edition comes out. So I don't know if these books are already in the works. So that's why they're coming out or what. But uh, yeah, I thought that was a little interesting. So, yes, Jorge, you are almost a regular. Yeah, I guess you're kind of a regular. I mean, you've been showing up quite often lately. That's cool. Very cool. Anyway, so as I mentioned, these Paizo releases will be coming out on July. I should say September. How was I going to say July? September 18th. Okay, so my final news piece. Green Ronin will be releasing the physical edition of the first campaign setting for Modern Age next week. And I've got the dope. The Modern Age RPG campaign, The World of Lazarus. The World of Lazarus is the first campaign setting for Green Ronin's new Modern Age RPG. Based on the critically acclaimed Lazarus series by Greg Rucka and Michael Lark, and presented by Image Comics, the book brings this noir dystopia to tabletop role-playing games. In the near future, time has rendered death obsolete, and life infinitely cheap. In the wake of government's failure and global upheaval, the family stepped in and divvied up the world. Now peace and order reign in a world of technological marvels and neo-feudalism. The families quietly war with one another, waging the lives of loyal serfs while they relax in lives of indulgence. All while the waste, those left behind by this new order, struggle daily for base survival. Play members of a family in the highest of high-stakes games, serfs fighting for their family's interest to maintain order and safety, or disaffected waste fighting for a better life in the burned ruins of the old world. Do note, the world of Lazarus requires the modern age basic rulebook to use. This 144-page book will be available in hardcover next week. It will cover, carry an MSRP of $34.95. It is available right now in PDF from my friends over at Drive-Thru RPG for $18.95. Do have to point out, 
there. It's a little pricey. It's a little pricey for a 144 page book. Green Ronin tends to be a little higher with their prices, I must say. So, uh, Jorge Rodriguez says the, he believes that Paizo will support uh, first edition for a little bit. I don't think it'll be very long. I gotta be honest. I do not think it'll be very long because it defeats the purpose of releasing a second edition. So I would take a guess these pocket editions that they're releasing were already in the pipeline. So they figure, well, might as well, might as well release those. So I would think probably by winter, we will not see new releases coming out for first edition from Paizo. That does not mean that these third party companies that do tons of Pathfinder stuff will not stick with first edition because there are going to obviously be people who will not like the second edition. They'll want to stick with the first edition. It's like that with every role playing game. I can see it already. It's on the horizon. So anyway, uh, so I was talking about uh, that PDF being available at drive through RPG. Do want to mention, of course, the gaming gang, as well as the daily dope happen to be affiliates of the one bookshelf sites, such as drive through RPG and Wargame vault. So if you're going to go to one of those sites, please stop by the gaming gang.com first, click on one of our links, drive through RPGs up top, Wargame vaults down on the bottom. And that way, if you do make a purchase, I'll get a small portion of that sale. And I mean, really small. But it all adds up, really helps out. And pretty much every month that pays for the hosting for the website. So that keeps the gaming gang around. Because we all know this is pretty much a not-for-profit <laughs> endeavor here. Speaking of, want to point out, let's bring down a little whiz bub real quick. So today is actually Lil Bub's birthday. It's her eighth birthday. And I, I talk about Lil Bub all the time because, as I've mentioned before, this is a not-for-profit endeavor. So if you like the website, if you like the channel, if you like this show, please consider making a small donation to Lil Bub's Big Fund and the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And because it's Lil Bub's birthday, let's hear from Lil Bub herself. That's right. Good job, bub. So anyway, as I mentioned, uh, today is Lil Bub's eighth birthday. They're actually having a party out in LA this weekend. It's kind of funny. They're, they're doing a, like a, like a VIP kind of thing. And it's pretty wild, pretty wild. As I mentioned before, you should check out lilbub.com, L I L B U B.com. Very, very interesting story behind this. This cat who has gone through a tremendous number of challenges, like many special needs animals do. So, as I like to point out, if you do make a small donation to Lil Bub's Big Fun, shoot me an email, let me know. You don't have to send me proof or anything. And if you do, of course, I will give you a quick shout out on the following show, if you'd like. Uh, and of course, just... My email address is right there in the corner. It's Jeff McAleer at thegaminggang.com. Okay, so I'm going to jump into Sorcerer in just a few moments. I want to talk about what's coming up on next week's shows. I'm going to shoot some standalone videos this weekend as well. I don't know how many I'm going to be able to get in, but I am going to get in some. So over the weekend, I'm going to shoot uh, an unboxing for Bushido 
from Gray Fox Games as well as its expansion. Making sure I'm holding this up correctly here. Uh, so I will be doing that. It's kind of a two-player dueling game. I'm also going to do an unboxing video for Kamigami Battles, which is from Japanime Games. Got to point out that the artwork's a little risque, uh, a little bit of cleavage, you know, a little fan service, I guess we'll say. But this is supposed to be actually a, a really interesting uh, kind of battle game. And I've got some, uh, like, promos as well. So I'll be showing that off. Then, because I really want to dive into this sooner rather than later, I don't want to wait until next Thursday for my RPG show to do it. I'm going to unbox and take a first look at the Call of Cthulhu starter set from Chaosium Inc. And if I have time, I'm going to do an unboxing video for Brides and Bribes, which is from, uh, it's released through Ares Games. It's from, uh, what is this, Space, Space Balloon Games, but it's released through Ares. And the reason why I want to do an unboxing of it uh, do a standalone is that uh, I think the board is actually pretty big. I saw this laid out at Origin, so it's pretty large. And you wouldn't think by the name, right? Brides and Bribes. You're thinking, ah, oh, yeah, it's probably some sort of kind of, you know, like family Euro ish game. It's not. It's supposed to take place, I think, in like the 16th century, and it's supposed to be very cutthroat. Nice. <laughs> right. So, I, uh, I am going to do some uh, standalone videos. Maybe pop them up, pop, start popping them up maybe on Sunday. Maybe I'll like spread them out one per day, even alongside the episodes of the Daily Dope. So, on Monday's show, I will be unboxing and taking a first look at Robotech Attack on the SDF1. This is a big box. This is a very hefty box. So this is supposed to contain a big standee of the SDF-1 that kind of rotates around to battle this Entrati. So that will be Monday's show. Tuesday's show. I'm going to unbox and take a first look at Volcanic Isle. This was the Origins game released from Arcane Wonders. So this looks pretty interesting. Uh, where you're competing with other villagers to put, I, what do they call them, Moai? I think they're Moai statues. Yeah, the Easter Island statues. And uh, you're actually blocking these vents with all this volcanic activity. So you're like splitting pieces of the island off. And you're trying to split pieces off that have your opponent's villages in it. So another kind of cutthroat game. I like that. I like a little take that in my games. What can I tell you? I like co-ops too, but... I like, I like games where I, I, something that I do affects the other players. That's why a lot of the puzzly Euro games I don't get into because it's like playing games in a vacuum. I say it all the time. Wednesday, War Game Wednesday, I will be taking a look at Peloponnesian War from GMT Games. This is a Mark Herman design. This looks like a pretty big, beefy game. Look at that map on the back there. So we'll take a look at that. Then on Thursday show... I'm going to review Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, the starter set from my friends over at Cubicle 7 Entertainment and Games Workshop. And I will give you a hint, give you a little clue. Really good stuff. I will get into the details about that on Thursday's show. If you haven't checked out my unboxing video, take a peek because you will see the quality to this is top notch compared to starter sets that come out. Uh, because, like, for an example, and I, I loved the 5th the edition D&D starter set that came out that had uh, Lost Minds of Fendelver, however you want to pronounce it. But uh, just, I mean, they were just like paper booklets, right? Mm -mm, not in this. Very, very nice. Really good price point, too. So we'll talk about that. We'll discuss on Thursday. Then on Friday, got another heavy box. Yay, yay, yay. I'm going to unbox and take a first look at Champions of Hera from my pals over at Greenbrier Games. That's right. It's got some minis in it. This has a lot of heft to it. Uh, and this is kind of a uh, 
It's another kind of cooperative, semi-cooperative, uh, and some somewhat confrontational game. Uh, I believe there's different ways you can play it. So, also want to point out, hey, I was just about to mention this gentleman's name, and he pops up in chat. Dan from No Enemies here. Uh, I believe Dan is sharing uh, what's going on on the Daily Dope next week on his own show. So, much appreciated that Dan's taking some time out to uh, share a little video I shot. Uh, yeah. My usual, you know, goofiness. My usual, like, uncomfortableness in front of the front of the camera. But uh, very, very cool. Good to see you, Dan. Glad to see you popping in. Uh, you should be off the computer, though, now. It's past the half hour. <laughs> anyway, yes, so that'll be, yes, uh, Dan's show airs on Saturdays. So by all means, check out No Enemies Here. Uh, main focus is, is kind of like conflict sims. That's why I'm kind of kind of surprised Dan asked me to share the video because people will be like, what's he sharing that knucklehead stuff? <laughs> he, like, like Herman Lettman's like, you do a role-playing game show. It's like, I really don't. I'm like, yeah, I talk about RPGs, like news and that. I only do one. I only do one show a week dedicated to RPGs. But it's funny, just like other people will sit there and they're, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, the, the Daily Dope, that's just like a war game show. It's like, why? Because I do like one day a week. It's like, it's just all kind of games. Speaking of all kind of games, I'm sure folks are tuning in because they want to take a peek at Sorcerer from White Wizard Games. It's designed by Peter Schultz. It's not spelt the way you'd think Schultz would be spelt, but I think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, with Rob Doherty and Darwin Castle. Artwork and graphic design are provided by, and get ready for all the mispronunciations, Jan Drenovic, Elena Kubakova, Vasik Pinsik, Peter Schultz, and Pavel Sirishuk. I know I got probably all of those wrong. Game is for two to four players, ages 14 and up, plays in around 30 to 90 minutes. This game is available now. It is out, and it does carry an MSRP of $49.99. So let's pop on over here. Uh, if you have been watching uh, recent episodes, as I've been touting how I was going to look at this on tonight's show, I keep mentioning that uh, my good buddy Herman Lettman, game designer Herman Lettman, who uh, many people know from, like, Dawn of the Zeds. Uh, a lot of wargamers know him from many of his wargaming designs. But uh, most casual gamers know him from Dawn of the Zeds. Probably my favorite zombie game. Anyway, Herman had an opportunity to play a demo game of this at Origins. He really enjoyed it. Now, I have to point out, of course, obviously enough, you can't really make a complete decision on a game based on just uh, a demo, but, um, uh, oh, I guess maybe Jorge's leaving chat. I don't know. Uh, it says, hope y'all have a good day. Well, Jorge, have a good day too. Uh, hopefully you catch uh, the unboxing later on. If you are leaving, I'm not chasing you out. But anyway, I was going to say, you, you can't really, you know, come to grips with like doing like a review based on demos, which I find funny because there are many companies that try to do that to me at, at uh, conventions, and I and I do not play demo games at conventions, uh, especially if they expect me to do a review based on a demo. Number one, I need to look at your rule book, see how easy it is for me to learn that game from the rule book, not having somebody sitting there showing me how to play. It's, you know, they don't come with the game. I'm not going to buy a game from the game store and have the designer come home with me to show me how to play it. So anyway, uh, well, text on the back's a little kind of difficult to, to make out here, but I'm not going to read all of it, but it says, Welcome to a dark Victorian world where the fire and smoke of industry blacken the sky. Okay, so I guess it's, it's the real world there back, back, back during the Industrial Revolution. Here there is a border between the worlds, the worlds of reality and the unknown. A border which is slowly disintegrating as faith in higher powers is pushed into the shadows by man's acceptance of technology. Across the border of the mortal realm, 
lies limbo where dark man it's really tough to read the back of this dark gods mythical monsters and fantastic creatures have been imprisoned for centuries but the sorcerers the offspring of the dark gods and mortals accepted the great purge oh escaped the great purge sorry they wait for their opportunity to regain their former strength now at the border uh, has all but completely dissolved and the two worlds collapse together the sorcerers return to take their rightful place their power far greater than any army Woo all right so uh this box is pretty good size there we go uh i don't have huge hands but just kind of give you an idea it's got some good heft as well so i don't think we're going to get a ton of air in this box when we open it nope there we go Oh, looks like we got a cool insert, too. So, uh, kind of dig a little bit of this around the box. It's a little extra, extra chrome here. So we've got the rule book. I assume it's the rule book. Doesn't say what it is. <laughs> I assume it's the rules. So we'll take a peek at the rules in just a sec. Looks like we got some punch boards. I know there are cards in here. I know there are custom dice in here. I do uh, know for a fact that uh, each of the... The sorcerers are battling to control three areas of London. You're playing in London. I know there are some expansions. I don't think they're out yet. I think they're on the horizon. And uh, I'm trying to remember. I think, if I remember correctly, I think one of them you're actually battling in Cairo. So... Supposedly, there'll, there will be enough expansions to this relatively quickly where um, you'll have a combination of, I think, like 124, 128 different sorcerers. Because I, I sort of think, and we'll find out by looking through, I'm sure, I sort of uh, believe that you kind of create your sorcerer almost the way you create your deck in Smash Up from AEG. You've got couple of smaller decks that you're going to put together based on i think like your magical school and kind of like your lineage something like that so taking a peek here it's showing us the box showing us what's in here oh hey player boards and rulebook go on top of everything there we go so uh we've got some space here for for expansions in the box as well <laughs> the inside lid of the box is a great place to roll dice i do that all the time i usually have a small small box top uh give you a great example I'll show you right there that's one of the games i use they have a little box top to roll dice in so we got the game contents we got character decks oh so it's actually three decks so we got character decks lineage decks domain decks so the domain decks i think are kind of like schools of magic so there are four of each so we got two player rules. I was very surprised to see that this goes up to four players. So that's cool. I'm, I'm glad to see that. So we've got the two player rules here. So yep, you create your unique sorcerer by combining one of the four character decks with one of the four lineage decks and one of the four domain decks. I would think uh, there's probably gonna be uh, a specific build of sorcerer that'll probably be more popular than others. I would take a guess you could probably roll dice to see who gets to pick which almost like a draft would be so picking your your lineage picking your your domain and so forth character deck too so uh it says each round players alternate spending actions to play spells draw cards gain energy or play minions so you're gonna have like minion creatures you're gonna have like probably offensive and defensive spells a lot of it's going to have to do with what is your domain. So we got the player boards. Got avatars. So we got little standees, huh? Okay. So each character has a matching avatar standee. So, oh, so you're going to move it around on the different battlefields. Got it. Got it. Talking about the cards. We got character skill cards, lineage skill cards, domain skill cards. Here's our gr grimoire. So we got mini, minis, minions, 
sorceries attachments. Talking about the graveyard, our battle dice. Damage counters, omen counters. Oh, what, it's Damien? Fate counters. Creating your sorcerer, random creation method. Recommended for the first few games. Oh, there you go, draft creation. There you go. Uh, talking about setup. Showing us the, the play area here. Well, looks like everything's laid out pretty simply. White Wizard Games uh, is well known for like Star Realms, Hero Realms, Epic Card Game. I happen to be a, uh, I happen to like Hero Realms better than I like Star Realms, which I like Star Realms, but for some strange reason, it's th that theme just grabs me more than uh, Star Realms does. And, and I have to admit, uh, Cameron, my nephew, and his friends really, really like. Uh, Hero Realms, and it's super easy to get into. Really easy to learn how to play. It took about five minutes to teach each of them how to play. So we've got uh, Ready Phase, Action Phase, Battle Phase. End of Round Phase. We've got some game terms. Partially Resolved Effects and Sorceries. Talking about Lineages. Talking about followers. There we go. Multiplayer rules. So we got Battle Royale. Three to six players. Uh, you would have to have a couple of copies of the game. <laughs> or some expansions. You'd have to have some expansions too. So we got Battle Royale. We got Team. 2v2 or 3v3. Then we got the credits. Ah, here we go. Here's the expansions. Uh, oh, so it looks like we've got, like, character packs. So along the lines of what they've done with uh, Star Realms and Hero Realms, like, uh, Hero Realms have, have, like, these character decks uh, and, like, villain decks and stuff like that. So it looks like that's uh, what they're doing, what they're putting together. There we go, Egyptian Battlefield. Extra player boards, extra dice. Cool deal. All right. And, of course, you can learn more at whitewizardgames.com so that's the rules let's take a look at this other stuff here so we got the punch boards shall we zoom in let's zoom in so got a couple of different styles so one is uh basically a star pentagram i guess we'll say and then this has like spiders on it these have like spiders and double-sided. So we've got, uh, looks like a knife or something almost. And these are like flames. Might be upside down. <laughs> might, might supposed to go like that. Usually the flames go upward. So there we go. So we've got that. So we've got, uh, here's the standees. Got the standees here. Here's one of them. Here's another one. Here, let's flip this around here. It looks almost like he's a demon. And then uh, we've got Cotton Mather <laughs> sitting there. So we got a little stance for the standees. We've got some, some more of these counters here. So then we've got uh, domain, character, and lineage. There you go. I like the artwork. The artwork's really nice. I like that. Very cool. Uh, nice, thick... Uh, Nice thick punch board, too. Not real thin. Uh, then we've got the player boards. So we've got... Wow. Nice. These are nice. Very nice. Let's zoom out a little bit. There we go. Uh, very, very well, well done. It's got a finish to it. Nice and thick. Good component quality. I like this. I like this a lot. So we've got the game round, battle phase, glossary... Got some trackers here. Looks like we've got uh, two different sides. Okay, so this is this looks like this is probably London, and then that looks like that would probably be like Egypt. That's cool. Looks like the info is about the same on both. But yeah, that's that's cool. It's kind of that's going the extra mile, right? They could have easily sat there and said, "There you go," 
and just had a blank back. So I believe we've got four of these because it's up to four players. And we do. There we go. So we got that. We got the locations. I'll zoom back in as we're going to take a look at some of these dice and stuff like that. If we can get a better look. There we go. So we've got the, the locations here for London. So this is Southwark. Yeah. And then... Uh, Oh, okay. So I'm I'm taking a guess. Okay, so you're battling over this. I'm taking a guess. That's like how much damage it can take. This area can take. And then once you've uh, once it's reached its damage point, you're gonna flip it over to like its ruined side. I'm a guessing. I'm just guessing. All right. So then we've got uh, old London. And then there's the. The ruined side of Old London. We've got Whitechapel. <laughs> Where's Jack? Where's Jack hanging out there? Now we've got ruined Whitechapel. Actually, Whitechapel looks probably nicer and cleaner than it really was back then. Uh, and then we've got uh, the Underground Hive. Okay. Cool. So uh, maybe you're randomly selecting uh, three areas out of the four. So we've got that. We've got uh, some decks of cards here. I think there's about 170 cards in this. We've got some tokens. We've got some, some little gems. we got some custom cut dice. So we've just, uh, we've got some wooden cubes. Just little tracker cubes, I'm sure. So we've got that. We've got uh, red and blue. Yeah. Yeah. We got the custom dice. These look pretty cool. They have uh, just like little little monster heads on them. And then it looks like there's a custom eight-sided die in this too. Big chunky eight-sided die. This is a cut die too, so it's not uh, it's not painted on, it's not laser printed on. These are cut. So are these dice as well. So I saw as we were looking through the book there. So that's a hit, that's two hits, and this is a critical hit. And I'll take a guess. The blanks are just misses. So we've got uh, seven of those dice. Nice dice. Got a little bit of heft to them too. I like dice that have a little, you know, a little bit of heft. That's cool. And then there's this big chunky eight cider. All right, get on back in there. Okay, so let's take a look at. Let's take a look at the cards. All right, I'm going to use the hobby knife to open these because, for some reason, these little pull strips never seem to work for me. I, I waste more time trying to get the pull strip than if I just take the hobby knife and cut it. Okay, so we got that. So I'll take a guess. Maybe these are already divided by domain, lineage, and character. Maybe not, because that looks like the same exact color backing. Which I would take a guess they should all have the same exact color backing. So there might be a symbol on the cards that will determine what uh, what these are. Seem to be like spider creatures. I'll tell you what, Elliot Miller, my best friend, what nuts? He hates spiders. He despises spiders. So uh, I don't think he would dig that too much. <laughs> Just like this, like the lineage has like the spider face on it. <laughs> So, and when I say he doesn't like spiders, I am serious. He really, doesn't matter if they're a little tiny spider, he just does not dig them. All right, so, uh, first of all, I can tell there's kind of a, oh, man, nice. We've got uh, a nice finish to it. I'm trying to remember um, what, the, what the term is for this finish. 
Now let me grab a quick sip here. All right, so got Rat Catcher. So these are minion cards. We have some minion cards. Okay, so I'm taking a guess. I'll zoom in a little closer on these. So I'm going to take a stab in the dark that this, this symbol right here is going to determine what deck this is part of. So Dan says, creepy art. Yes, thank you, Dan. Linen finish. That's what I kept... I'm thinking, it's not fabric. It's like fabric. Yes, it's a linen finish to these. Uh, but yeah, the artwork's pretty cool. Yay, he's a rat catcher. Little kid. Little kid's a rat catcher. But I'm taking a guess. This is probably going to be the, the deck it comes from. I'm taking a stab. So, got a rat catcher. Segment's champion. Looks like these are kind of minion cards here. Underworld Guide. Vengeful Mummy. A couple of those. A few of those. Asmodeus or Asmodeus. So we've got some demons. Cerberus. It's a pistol, though. Is it like a flame shooting pistol? Could be. It's a tactic card. Demonic Ambitions. Impulsive Zealot. He's another minion. He's a demon. So they're kind of like demon cards. Innocent Blood. A few of those. Lucifer's Jester. Jeez. Well, I can see there's a certain type of gamer who won't be playing this. <laughs> With the demons in that. Taunting Raurik. Vengeful Baron. Bloodbath. Coven Concubine. <laughs> uh, looks like this is a, a vampire. So it's a character. Another vampire. Legacy in Blood. So it looks like those are... Uh, okay, Night Vale Hunter. Those are a couple of those. Ravenous Aristocrat. Yeah, there were some that were kind of like specific characters. Soul Eater. Voiceless Covenant. Blood Guard. There we go. Get some spiders in there. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Elliot would not like that artwork at all. He would be like, oh, man. Lord of the Flies. And I mentioned this because uh, if anybody out there remembers the film Arachnophobia which was actually a fun film. It was just kind of, yeah, it wasn't really scary, it, but uh, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, Elliot refused to see it. He's like, no, giant, It's it's got spiders in it. Nope, 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 nope. Okay, so we've got those cards. Let's take a look at this deck here. So, uh, Dagger of Shadows. So these are like tactic cards. Right of Blades. Look at that, there's like an eye on the pommel of this dagger. Shadow cast. Soul shadow. Well, I'll tell you what. So far, the artwork and the uh, production quality is really, really well done. Okay, just flipping through some of these here. Insidious call. Yeah, Butcher's Cleaver. That's nice. Hmm. Okay, so it's kind of like a, almost like an avian creature. Got like a human face. So what is this? Uh, Sweeney Todd here? Jeez. You're very, very cool. Devoted Worshipper. Devouring Lurker. Oh, yeah, that's nice. A nice uh, goblet full of tentacles. Hey, Nefarious Coel's popping in. Good to see you, Nefarious. Seeker's Embrace. Yeah, there's a... Uh, there's, this artwork's very cool. Council of Three. Foul Necromancer. 
Lord of the Undead. Oh, that's cool. I like that artwork. There's a few Lords of the Undead. I'm kind of surprised. Raise the Dead. And Ratcatcher. We saw that card before, too. And then we've got the third deck. We saw this card also. This kind of weird, like, spider dude. So we've got uh, Oberon Sentry. Queen's Gambit. Reshape the Mind. Say... Tania's Tear? Looks like it's some sort of a, like a, an amulet. Web Spinner. There we go. Get those spiders in there. Okay. Now we got some, some of the characters again. Knight Templar. So the reality is all these sorcerers are all, all bad guys. So it does not look like any of these sorcerers are going to be good guys. So they're all just using various different domains of magic that are all pretty much evil is what it looks like here. Because they're all vying for power. They're all looking to take over London. So, uh, Harry Mace is popping in. Hey, all right. Welcome aboard, Harry. It's a first time visitor, I believe. Well, he's first time in chat. So yes, this art is really, really impressive. Uh, I don't, I gotta be honest, Nefarious, I do not know if, uh, that was, uh, Titania was a, um, minor god or not. I don't think it was Greek. Then again, maybe, I don't know. Uh, Dread Wait. Stray Sinner? It's like a ghost. Doomed Spirit Keeper? Energy bound profits. Horatio the outcast. <clears throat> Alas, I knew him well. Plague bearer. Prowling defiler. Corpse feeder. Ooh, pretty gross. Daughter of Hectate. Or Hecate, I should say. Featherless Murder. Lamia the Child Eater. I'm taking a guess the, the number up in the top corner is probably an indicator of like how powerful the card is. Uh, Kabuki Kid says that uh, that's a Queen of the Fairies. Yeah. Oh, that's very, very possible. The Fairy says, I like the dark themes of this. Gonna have to see what the gameplay is like. Yes, I agree. I'm right with you. Okay, so uh, we've got Blood Pool. So I'm gonna take a guess. I think these are the characters. So we got Miselda. Yeah, see, right there it says it's a character. So we got. There's one of the characters. There's the, another one of the characters. There's the third one. And then here's the fourth one. The one I was joking was Cotton Mather. So then we've got lineage. So we've got the necromancer. The demonologist. The blood lord. And the animist. With the spider. Oh, Romano, British Fairy Queen. Very good, Nefarious. Thank you. So uh, we've got the domain. So we've got uh, on, of the Forgotten Temple. So their domain is Jerusalem. Of the Outcast Sanctuary. That domain is Paris. Uh, of the Screaming Coast. That domain is Cyclades. And then of the Haunted Forest is Limerick. Okay. So, cool. All right. So, that's those cards here. And uh, I guess this Blood Pool card might sit out. Or maybe this Blood Pool card is specifically for the, like the, the vampire 
the uh, kind of like vampires there. All right, so we've got those. So we have the three decks. I'm going to zoom back out because I'm going to show the insert here because this, this is a pretty cool insert. There we go. So we got an insert to hold everything. Got here is, you know, put your cards in there. So I'm just going to put the decks of cards back under here, which is where they were before. So we've got uh, three different decks of cards. So about 170 cards total. I think that was, I think that's what they were saying. About 170. We've got the, uh, the little jewels. We've got the custom cut dice. We've got the little markers there. So we've got the four different location tiles. Let's go right there. We've got the four player boards, which are really nice. And these are dual sided as well. So I, saw, I thought that pretty cool going the extra mile with these. Kabuki Kid says, Spider-Man, nobody knows who you are. Uh, I'm fairly well versed in Spider-Man lore, but so they've got the two sheets. We've got the two punch boards of counters and standees. And um, I'm not sure. I Maybe this is for drafting stuff because we got domain character and lineage. And then we got the rule book, which uh, rule book looks like is very nicely laid out. I didn't, it doesn't look like there's tons of examples though, but uh, there's plenty of artwork. So we find out, and that is what we find when we take everything from Sorcerer outside the box. As I mentioned before, Sorcerer is from White Wizard Games. It, uh, it is for two to four players, ages 14 and up. Obviously, we saw the artwork. You don't want probably little kids playing with that cards with that artwork. Probably creep them out. Game does play in around 30 to 90 minutes. Of course, I think with four players, you're looking at the 90. The game is available right now, and it does carry an MSRP of $44.99. Of course, I will have a review of Sorcerer in the very near future. I'm hoping to get it to the table this weekend uh, with uh, Cameron, but not sure. Uh, so Nefarious is asking, when is this supposed to be released to retail? As far as I know, it is out now. I believe it is available now because there are, um, or at least I th heard through the grapevine, I thought there were reviews out for it already. So I don't know. Uh, all right, so as I mentioned, <clears throat> I'm gonna have some standalone unboxing videos uh, that I'll be shooting this weekend. Probably have one pop up on Sunday and then I'll release uh, a few of them throughout the week. But on Monday's show, I will be unboxing and taking a first look at Robotech Attack on the SDF-1 from Japanime Games. So that will be on Monday's show. So there you have it. That's it for tonight's show. As I like to point out, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, please visit thegaminggang.com. For all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV, by now you know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Everybody have a great weekend. Those of you hanging out in chat, thank you very much for keeping me company. I'm surprised Dan hung out for quite a while. <laughs> His girlfriend must be out shopping or something. <laughs> so, <laughs> everybody have a safe weekend as well. If you watched live and didn't jump in chat, Come on, I don't bite. Everybody's pretty friendly. Say hello. And of course, if you're watching after the fact, I love you as well. Thank you very much for watching. And I will see you on Monday. Thanks again for watching The Daily Dope, presented by The Gaming Gang. If you liked this episode, be sure to give it a quick thumbs up. And... If you dig the channel, please subscribe. If you'd like to check out our previous episode, click right here. And if you want to check out a somewhat randomly selected episode, give a click right down here. It'll be like opening a box of Cracker Jacks. You just don't know what you'll get. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'm Jeff McAleer.